second. Welcome, everybody. Good to be together again. A very warm welcome to you all. Lots to give thanks for this morning. We thank God for a new day. Thank God for the sunshine for one another. We thank God that the Lord Jesus is risen. Um, he's alive today. That means he's present with us here and now. The risen Lord Jesus. Amazing thought. Great to welcome you if you're um, new today, or perhaps you've been with us over Easter. You're coming back. Lovely to have you here. Um, welcome if you're watching online as well. Um, just to, I, I think we know what we're doing, but let me just remind us, what, what is it we're doing when we meet together like this? We've come together to worship our God with our lips. We're going to sing praise to him because he's worth our praise for all he is and has done. Um, we're also coming to get help to worship God with our whole lives. And so we need to hear from him in the Bible as we go out to live for him in the week. Um, so the Bible's pretty important. Can you imagine life without a Bible? If, um, if you can at all, that's not a good sign. Um, imagine life without a Bible. You don't have one in your house. Um, you, you've never sort of opened one. You've never read one. We would know nothing of God. We couldn't know him personally. We couldn't hear him truly and accurately. It'd be an extraordinary state of affairs not to have a Bible. And we're going to sing praise to God for his words. But we have Bibles. Um, it's a wonder, really. And there's a, a really long song in the Bible, Song 119, all about God's Word. And in that song, there's a little refrain, a repeated line that comes, and it prays to God. It says, God, give me life according to your Word. Give me life. I can only have that as I read and hear you in your Word. So I'm going to pray that we'd know life from him today in the way that we need most as we hear his word, as we sing praise to him as well. Um, let me lead us in a prayer, asking that we would know him and know life in him because of his word. I'm going to pray use, using some phrases from that great song, Psalm 119, um, some things to say thank you to God about, and then some things to ask him for. We praise you today, Lord God. You are mighty. You are our heavenly Father. You always do the right thing. You are always merciful. And we thank you for your word, which is wonderful and eternal. Your word is the light that we need, is the honey that we crave. And so, Lord God and heavenly Father, please open our eyes today to see wonderful things in your word. Do good to us, your people, and give us life according to your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to praise God for his word. Our first song, your word alone is the solid ground we need. Let's stand as the musicians lead us. Thank you. 
justified. His righteousness is all our plea. Your lost demands are satisfied. His perfect work has set us free. and give praise and glory to God for the risen Lord Jesus. The only way we know he's risen is by his word. So he's not a dead figure of history. He's a living Lord every single day. And we're going to declare our faith in the resurrection now. And we're going to say that Christ has died for sins in accordance with his word, in accordance with the scriptures. So the words will come on the screen. They're on the sheets as well. Let's declare our faith in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins in accordance, he was buried on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. Do have a seat. got a pot here which um, you might use for cooking a large amount of food, maybe pasta or rice or something like that. Um, just imagine that um, this pot is the world. And in the world are all the people, little grains of rice, and they've got all the water around them. That's the kind of society we live in. And most people live as if um, you and the people around you and society is all there is. That's all there is to life. And sometimes Christians can live that way too. It's just me, other people, and society around me. And what the death and resurrection of Jesus does to the world is it lifts the lid and says, no, no, there is more. There is more to it. And there's a person cooking, there's a room in which the pot is. But we know as Christians there's more to this world than just people and the stuff around us. There is a future. There is something after death. There is more than just what's in the world. And when Christians forget that, that's, um, that's bad news. That's forgetting God and what he's done. So we're going to acknowledge in our words now, we've got it on the screen and on the sheets, ways in which we deliberately forget what God has done in raising Jesus. And so we end up living as if this world is all there is. A foolish thing to do if there's more. Take a moment, you might think of how ways this week we've forgotten to live in the light of Jesus' resurrection and the future that there is for those who trust him. Just a few moments in the quiet and then we'll pray as I lead us. O Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we bow before you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. 
We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We've lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We've lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. Lift our minds above earthly things. Set them on things in heaven. Show us your glory and your power, that we may serve you gladly all our days. Lord, hear us and help us. Amen. Later this term, we're going to come to this verse in Romans chapter 4. It says, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins. That's why he died. Not just an accident, not even an accident. It was for our sins. And then it says, Jesus was raised to life for our justification. So we might be declared in the right with the living Lord God. We're going to turn to pray. And before we pray, we're going to sing a song reminding us of why we pray. It's a song that's got lots of lines in which make no sense at all. Um, Lots of lines in which are nonsense. Um, You may know it, you remember the song. It's got um, a line about a potato um, trying to swim. It's got a line about uh, a mountain trying to brush its teeth. Doesn't make sense. No sense at all. Why do we sing that? Because it's a great little... It's a bit like when we don't pray. And Christians not praying makes no sense at all. It's nonsense. Have you ever had that feeling? Oh, I just didn't pray about that at all. I haven't been praying about that. That's a really big deal. That's nonsense for the Christian. And do you see what what we're going to sing about our God? He is the King of Heaven. We're going to sing that everything is in His hands. We're going to sing, verse 2, that He's always good. Let's stand and sing. If you'd like to join in the actions, I'll try and do some of them. You can come up here if you'd like to join me. Um, Let's stand and sing.
with God instead. Excellent. Do have a seat. We're going to do that now. David's going to lead us as we rely on him. Good morning. Um, we're going to be including within our prayers this morning some of the mission part um, organisations that we have been supporting. Um, so please join with me as we pray together. After each prayer, I'll say Amen, and then if you agree with my prayer, if you can say, let it be so, Lord. Father God, we thank you that your amazing, unfathomable love has been poured out for us at the cross and poured into us by the Holy Spirit. We want to taste and experience more of the depth and breadth and length and height of your amazing love. Help us to walk by faith. Help us to endure in suffering. Help us to own our need of you. Help us to fully embrace your son, Jesus Christ, our redeemer. So pour out your love into our hearts in increasing measure by the power of your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is in his name that we pray, amen. Heavenly Father, we would pray for the annual church meeting later today. We pray that you would give clarity of thought and unity of purpose as important matters are discussed. We also pray that you would help personal agendas to be put aside so that we would be united in seeking what is best and what is in line with your will for the church. We humbly ask for your leading and directing in all that is said and done. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, to speak the truth in love, and to always remember that your will be done, not ours. Amen. We believe that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation for those who believe. So we pray for mission organisations we have been supporting, CPAS, Gideon's UK, Friends International, Dorset, Oak Hill College, Growing Young Disciples, Gospel UK and Gospel Partnerships. We pray that you would open doors of opportunity for them, help them pass barriers to hearts ready to receive your word, give them strength and stamina when they face opposition and when their ministry seems to be fruitless, but also give them the encouragement of seeing the fruits of their labor and give them times of peace and relaxation to refresh them where they can deepen their relationship with you to make them more effective in their ministry. Amen. We would also pray for the Vox course for young people starting on the same night as Hope Explored this coming week. We pray for bold and prayerful inviting that young people would come here and believe and be saved by the Lord Jesus. And we pray for more leaders for the Thursday night club who would be able to properly disciple the young people who we pray and hope would join the group and that you, you would use all of these things for your glory. Amen. And Heavenly Father, as the tensions escalate between Iran and Israel, we would seek your divine protection amongst this turmoil. Grant wisdom to our leaders, instill strength in the United Nations, and bring stability to this region. Guide us towards peaceful resolutions and shield the innocent from harm. May your love overcome hostility, your light dispel the darkness of conflict, and may you reveal yourself as the God of peace for all nations. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we would bring before you this morning those with particular needs in our church family. And we would name before you um, Sandy, Mary, Leo, Sylvia, Diana, Amy, Toby, Jeanette, Margaret and Frank and Margaret. Please alleviate their worries and sorrows. Help them to know your love and care for them. Please restore them to health again and grant them the grace and strength to accept their burdens and acknowledge your will and to know that what you do, <clears throat> you do out of your great and inexhaustible love for them. And we ask all of these things <clears throat> 
in the name of our great God, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. David, thank you very much. Um, just in a few minutes' time, and then those aged from naught to year six will head out to their groups, but we just need to hear a few things of really important news before then. Um, we've just prayed about most of them, um, but even before that, um, because there's a nice, uh, nice little gathering of people who haven't been here for very long, I wonder if we could just take 30 seconds to say hello to someone who's a different age to you. Hi, how are you? And just say hello just for 30 seconds. Someone a different age to you. Good. Carry on over coffee. Far too short. Right. I hope you can stay um, for coffee afterwards. There'll be a chance to talk more. David prayed for our annual meeting, which is this evening. It's at 6 p.m. Um, don't be confused, you may have read it as 4 p.m. in the prayer diary. Please don't um, turn up then, but at 6 o'clock we meet for the annual church meeting. Can I recommend you take a copy of the annual report for 2023? Lots of copies of this available at the back. This is really, really encouraging reading. Um, it looks like a few people have written some reports, but actually as you read them, you'll see that lots of members of the church family have said, oh, I thank the Lord for this because every week... Um, pick up one of these, have a read before you come this, this afternoon. And this afternoon, we, we pray this evening will be uh, really, really encouraging as we look back and very exciting looking forward. Lots of people are worried about things. I'm one of those, but I'm more excited about what God might do in the future. So do come this, this evening, 6 p.m., grab an annual report um, before you, you do and bring, bring others along as well. Um, David prayed too for um, two courses starting at the same time deliberately, the Vox course for secondary school age people, and then Hope Explored also at the same time. That's on Thursday this week, the 18th. Um, there are little reminder cards, flyer cards, invitation cards available. Those are for the Hope Explored course and the Vox course green ones. Um, so Thursday Night Club will be praying hard for their friends and contacts, um, but do be praying for that. That's this Thursday. Now, the notice sheet has a various other things, so do take that away, please, um, as you head off from today. Um, but just before we go to groups, Kate is going to come and talk to us with Sam about the weekend. Here we are again. Guess what we're going to talk about. Right, thank you for signing up those people who have about the church weekend. As you know, there is an enormous field <laughs> for the church weekend and lots of activities that we've got planned. Now, the most important part of Christian ministry about anything that anybody does is you need to sign up because we need to know two things. How many chairs to get out and how many cups to put out. Okay, so if you feel that you might be coming for some or part of it, you do not have to come for all of it, but some or part of it, please do fill in the form um, so we know, so we can be as prepared as possible. But we have been asked, Mark and I have been asked various questions of which Sam is going to ask me now in an interactive fashion. Kate... Yes, Sam. Do I have to come for the whole weekend? No, Sam, you do not. But please sign up whenever you might be coming so we know to put chairs out and to get enough cups out for everybody. That would be great. Can I bring my camper van? Yes, you can. You don't have to camp. For those who don't like being so close to the ground, if you have a camper van, you're very welcome to bring it. There is a, a different charge, £20 for two people or £15 if you're coming on your own. If you have friends who'd like to, you know, join in your camper van, that's fine, but there will be sort of additional charges on that. But yes, you can bring a camper van or a tent. What about electric? Is there electric hookup? I'm afraid you can't bring curling tongs, hair dryers, iPods, anything like that, because there is no electrical hookup. Please make sure everything is charged before you come, but there is no electrical hookup. Cold showers only. No, there's not. I don't know. Showers are hot, I think. Showers are hot. Can I bring my dog or cat? 
Dogs, cats, rabbits, pets. Um, this is an interesting one. I think this is where we have to consider everybody who's coming. I know there are some people who are actually quite scared of dogs, little people particularly. The campsite is happy for dogs to come, but I would suggest and I would possibly request if somebody can look after your dog for the weekend or for the bits that you're coming, that would probably be the best option so we can be considerate of everybody to be able to feel pretty uncomfortable. Um, we don't know about the hall. I just think we should make that kind of rule that if you have a dog, please come for some of it. If it's happy to stay in the car, for, if you can take it for a walk and then it's happy to stay in the car for a bit and then take it for another walk, then I would say yes, fair enough. But I think for the sake of family life and for everybody to feel comfortable, if you have somebody to look after your dog, that would probably be better. Um, cats are a law unto themselves, so bring it if you want. Um, right, uh, sign-ups, yes. On the sign-up sheet, on the back of the sign-up sheet, you will see that there are various options and trips on the Saturday afternoon. One of them is to the steam train line, the Corf Stream steam train line runs next to the hall. So there is an option to get some tickets and for a group to go on that if you'd like, but we will need to know about that. So please tick on the form if you would like to do that. For those that don't want to, we'll put on a movie, there'll be a walk planned. So if you, again, if you can just let us know so we know roughly what numbers we're dealing with, that would be really helpful. Likewise, if you have a blue badge, that's helpful for us to know for parking. Um, and also if you can offer a lift to anyone else, that would be really helpful too. So do fill in both sides of the form. Oh, poke myself in the eye. Right. Um, if, like the vast majority of us, you forget the things that you're going to bring to church on Sunday and you haven't keep meaning to bring your form, don't worry, you can screenshot it and either WhatsApp it to us if you're on in the church directory or you can just email it to us and our email address is on the back of the form. So don't feel that you have to have a physical copy because we will put you on a spreadsheet. So um, if you could do that, that would be really, really helpful. Um, we have a short video. You will also see on the Saturday, there's a guy called Bertie Pierce, who is it fair to say is a friend of Tom and Isabel's? Um, and uh, he is coming to do some entertainment. He's an illusionist and entertainer, and he's got a short video, which we're going to show you now. So do sign up. If you need to know more, please ask. Um, but let's encourage one another. It's good to meet together. Even if you only come for a small amount of it, it'll be lovely to spend time together. Thank you. very, very big hello to you all at Christchurch Westbourne. My name is Bertie Pierce, and I'm delighted to be coming to perform two magic shows for you on Saturday, June the 15th. I've always enjoyed magic, just a, a little bit of illusion here, there and everywhere. And so these are tricks that I'll be doing, clever tricks, fun tricks. And I know that the first show I'm doing will be suitable for children. And indeed, I always bring to those shows my good friend, Cyril, the teddy bear. Hi, Cyril. You feeling okay? Yeah. You're happy to be coming to Christ Church Westbourne? Yeah. Do you say anything else apart from yeah? Yeah. But you're happy about it? We're kids, man. Well, Cyril, I think we're going to have a lot of fun when we go down. So the first show will be very much suitable for children. But again, I'm going to do a second show, more for the adults, but again, that will be suitable for children if they're there. It will be enormous fun. And as a follower of the Lord Jesus, I'm delighted to come and celebrate and have fun with you and your church family. So come along, enjoy the magic, we'll have lots of fun. And by the way, I will need quite a lot of helpers uh, to help me make the illusions happen. So looking forward to it. So I will see you then. Great, all will be revealed in the middle of June. Um, forms, I think, are still available um, on the desk, so if you haven't yet got one, do pick one up from there. I'm going to pray that uh, God in the mist would help us uh, with this morning, and he would give us life according to his word. Let's pray, shall we, as we go to groups. Let's ask him to be powerfully at work by his word. Gracious Father, we know the Bible is a lamp that you've given us. It's light that we need. It's food for our souls, and we pray, please, this morning, you would teach us, and open us up to what you're saying, that we might hear you, and trust you, and love you, and obey you, and be glad to be yours, and delight in you more. We pray it for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. So if you're here for a first time, and you're aged between naught and year six, 
um, then do make your way to the back. Others will be going to groups as well. On the screen will be a sign for, for where to go to, according to your years of school. Um, and we're going to sing as the younger ones head out as we prepare to hear the word in here. So let's stand as we sing and the younger ones will head to their groups. again. Uh, the reading this morning is John 21 verses 1 to 14, which can be paid, found on page 1090 of the Church Bible. John 21 verses 1 to 14. <clears throat> Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, 
towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. Perhaps you've been in the situation where you've considered your life, where you're at, the life you've lived in the past and your your way ahead, and you feel like it's all a bit aimless, misdirected, without any purpose. Perhaps you feel like you actually don't know which direction to turn to. You're considering the way ahead and you just have no thoughts as to what a productive life might look like. Perhaps you understand the gospel, but you don't understand how the gospel shapes your life. Perhaps you know, you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you trust that he's been raised from the dead, but you don't understand what his resurrection means for you now. Yes, it's the hope held out for you in the future, but what does Christ's resurrection mean for me now? That, I hope, will be answered as we dive into John chapter 21 together. Let me pray, and then we'll get stuck in. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ still speaks, and we're able to hear his voice. We pray Father, would you help us to hear his voice this morning? And would the reality of the resurrection shape our lives, give us direction, give us purpose, and encourage us to serve you with the time that you have given us? Amen. Well, as we look at John chapter 21 this morning, we're going to be doing three things, the same three things we did last week. We're going to be looking at the story, so I'll run through the story and highlight some details for us, details that we might simply pass over if we're just doing a a quick reading of the story. We'll then dive into the theology and ask, what is God doing in this passage, and how is He teaching us? How does the theology then shape our understanding of what's going on here and in our lives? And then we'll conclude by applying this passage to our lives. What does John chapter 21 verses 1 to 14, mean for us today? Well, let's begin by looking at the story. As we're diving into John chapter 21, it's very important that we understand the context of what's happened over the last few days, the last couple of weeks. Jesus Christ, roughly two weeks ago, was crucified on the Friday night. He was, he was killed, crucified, uh, died, and he was buried Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate, can I take his body down from the cross? Pilate gave him permission, and then we find out that a tomb has been prepared for him. Jesus is buried, he is covered in cloth, he is covered in spices, he's wrapped. The tomb is then shut with a big stone rolled across it. Three days later, Mary, uh, on the Sunday morning, before light is up, in the dark, wanders over to the tomb, and she discovers that the stone has been rolled away, and she thinks that they've taken the Lord Jesus Christ's body out of the tomb. They think that, she thinks that people have stolen it and taken him away. She calls the disciples, two of them run, Peter and John, 
they see that the stone has been rolled away, they walk into the tomb and they witness the fact that there's just cloth left in the tomb. And there's a particular detail given. It's the cloth that wrapped his body and the cloth that wrapped his head. And we're told at that point, John, seeing that evidence, believes. John believes. Well, they run back to all the other disciples as they left and as they leave Mary. Jesus appears to Mary. She doesn't understand who he is. She thinks he's the gardener. But it's at hearing his voice that Mary realizes this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to her. That same night, that evening, the first day of the week, the first Sunday following Christ's crucifixion, Jesus makes an appearance to the disciples for the first time. He shows them his hands and his side. He shows them that he has been raised from the dead. He is alive and well. He's defeated death. He's had victory on the cross. Christ appears to them. He says, peace be with you. He breathes on them. We're told he gives them the Holy Spirit. And he sends them out into the world just as he has been sent into the world. He commissions the disciples. Only one problem. There was one disciple who was not with them. All the other disciples tell him, Thomas, Jesus Christ appeared to us. He is alive and well. He's been raised from the dead. Thomas does not believe a word of it. So a week later to the day, Jesus Christ appears for a second time to the disciples. He appears to them, and this time he has a very specific purpose. He's going to show his wounds to Thomas, the disbelieving disciple. Thomas's response is the only response that Christ deserves. My Lord and my God. John gives us these two accounts for reasons. One, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He has sent his di disciples out. He's commissioned them. But secondly, the second appearance, John gives us an expectation of how we're to come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has appeared to Thomas, but this is not going to be the normal way of coming to faith in Jesus. Jesus is not going to appear to all of us so that we might see who he is. No, belief, we're told by John, will come from reading the pages of Scripture. He says, these things were written. His gospel was written that we might believe that, Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we might have life in his name. How are we going to come to faith? John's making it explicit. We're going to come to faith as we read these words, God's word, telling us all about Jesus. Today, we have John writing about the third time Jesus appears to the disciples. Take a look down to John chapter 21, verse 1. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened in this way. So here we have John now giving a third account of Jesus' appearance. And he appears to seven of the disciples um, at the Sea of Tiberias. Notice that the, the, you might notice that the last time that um, Jesus was at the Sea of Tiberias with the disciples is the time when he fed the 5,000 with fish and bread. Here we are at the Sea of Tiberias, and the disciples seem to be mulling around almost aimlessly. We're told Simon Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the others, as if they've got nothing better to do and no plans for themselves, say, well, we'll come with you. It's like a group of lads hanging around on the couch in the lounge on a Friday night and saying to themselves, well, we've got nothing else to do. What should we do? And Peter says, well, let's go fishing. And they all say, yeah, we'll follow after you, Peter. So they go off fishing. Now, if you're reading this passage along with me, surely you'd be in the same position and you'd, you'd be a little bit surprised, wouldn't you? A little bit disappointed. Jesus appeared to the disciples. He commissioned them. He gave them his Holy Spirit. He, he sent them out. They've seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, someone who has died, defeated death, defeated sin, offered us forgiveness, offered us a message to the rest of the world, 
that his kingdom rules and he reigns. And here we have the very group of men who understand the significance of this message standing up and saying, well, should we go fishing? Yeah, let's go fishing. It comes, a bit of, it comes across as a bit of a, an anticlimax, would you not think? They have been commissioned to go out into the world to claim Christ's kingdom through the proclamation of the gospel. And here we find them deciding almost aimlessly to go fishing. That is the sense of the passage. It leaves us slightly disappointed. But John's vocabulary also leaves us slightly disappointed with the disciples. We're we're told that the disciples went out. They got into a boat at night, verse 3. Now, there's two things to consider. Normally, when people went about fishing in this day and age, it was at night. That was the time to fish. That was the time to to catch your haul. But John's gospel is also symbol-laden with the words he uses. So when John refers to night, it often refers to confusion, unbelief, and even worse, working against the Lord Jesus Christ. So John chapter 1, we're told Jesus Christ comes into the world and the light shines in the darkness. John chapter 3, Nicodemus is speaking to Jesus, and we're told he comes to Jesus at night. He's confused. He doesn't understand who Jesus is. John chapter 3 again, Jesus tells us the wicked love the darkness. John chapter 13, straight after the Lord's Supper, Judas is about to betray Jesus Christ, and we're told he went out and it was night. So here we are, John chapter 21, and the disciples go fishing at night. They're being presented as disciples without purpose, without drive, vision, or aim, without a mission that lies ahead of them. They seem distracted, and worse still, they're unsuccessful. John chapter 21, verse 3, they catch nothing. Fortunately, the story doesn't end there. Take a look at verse 4. As day is breaking in, in the early morning, As the sun rises, so light begins to shine in on the darkness. Jesus stands on the shore. Where are the disciples? They're still in the dark. They don't realize who it is that's standing on the shore. But just as Jesus' voice brought clarity to Mary earlier on, so Jesus' voice will bring clarity and direction to the disciples here in their confusion. Jesus calls out, friends, haven't you, have you not caught any fish? His question anticipates a negative answer. So the question is more like, you've not caught anything to eat, have you? Their answer comes back, no. Jesus says, throw your nets on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll find some. The disciples listen to this mysterious voice. They have been fishing for hours. They are experienced fishermen. They know how to fish. They know the time to fish. It's not simply a case of throwing your nets on the other side of the boat. They've been fishing all night. They have been unsuccessful. And yet they obey this mysterious voice. They throw their nets out on the other side of the boat, and all of a sudden, we're told, they catch many fish, so many that they're unable to haul them onto the boat. Light breaks into darkness, and John turns to Peter and says, it is the Lord. John's always the first one to perceive a reality. Peter seems to always be the one that acts on reality. He, he takes his garment, puts it over himself, ties it to himself, dives into the water, and presumably swims then to the Lord Jesus Christ. The other disciples follow after him, but they follow him after him in the boat. Once they're on shore, they're wel- on shore, they're welcomed by a fire that's already been prepared for them. There's some fish there and there's some bread already there. Then Jesus says to the disciples, bring some of the fish that you have caught. Simon Peter once again jumps up and acts. He goes into the boat and he hauls all, this, all these fish onto the shore. 
and we're told, we're given some details. John zooms in on these two significant details, or what might be called insignificant. They count the fish, and they are 153 large fish, a large catch of a large, of large fish. And the net used to catch them is not broken. It seems to be the case that having caught this massive amount of fish, the disciples at least expected the, the net itself would have been broken. Yet here John tells us it's a large catch of a large amount of fish, and the net is not broken. Jesus then invites them onto the shore and to have breakfast with him. Now notice, who went out to get fish? Who went out to get something to eat? The disciples. Peter said, I'm going fishing. I will all follow along with you. And yet, who is the one who provides fish for them to eat? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is there on the shore waiting for them with a meal prepared. Jesus provides. They're all sitting around eating fish and bread, wonderfully cooked by the Lord, and they dare not ask him who he is, we're told, because they know who he is. And yet there's this confusing situation where they see this is the Lord Jesus Christ. They know it's him, and yet there's this hesitation. Do we ask him if it is him? But they know it is him. That's the story uh, here that we have in John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. So what is the theology? What can we learn about God in this passage? Well, I think the message, the theology at least, teaches us that God calls us to a life shaped by the reality of the resurrection. God calls us to life shaped by the reality of the resurrection. The first thing to focus in on in this story is that it is about the resurrection. So right at the beginning, verse 1, we're told this is the third time that Jesus is going to appear. And then right again at the end of the story, this is the third time that Christ is appearing to the disciples. John begins and ends this portion by referring to the resurrection. This story is about the resurrection. The story is shaped by the reality of the resurrected Lord. The story begins with the disciples who go fishing, and it's a massive anticlimax. They have seen the risen Lord. They have been commissioned, sent out, and yet, here they are fishing. We are expecting an action-packed, purpose-filled response to the Lord Jesus Christ, and instead we see some men deciding to go catch fish. There's nothing wrong with going to catch fish, but John's including this portion of the story right here where we would expect something else, something more exciting would be taking place. John tells us they're going fishing at night, and as we've already unpacked, that shows there's some confusion already. The aimlessness that the disciples begin with is going to be shaped by the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reality of the resurrection will shine a light in on their darkness. What is the purpose of this narrative? The purpose of this narrative is to tell us how the reality of the resurrection should shape our understanding of what lies ahead for the disciples and what lies ahead for us. John does this, I think, by alluding to a few passages before this in John's Gospel to fill out some of the significance. So what do I think the res re resurrection means for us from this passage? Well, number one, as you can see on the screens there, what does the resurrection mean? Jesus is still with us. Jesus still speaks to us. Jesus still provides. Jesus' mission will succeed. So let's unpack that quickly. The disciples have been fishing all night and they've caught nothing, we're told by John. Why have they not been able to catch anything this whole night? Well, John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says to the disciples, without me, you can do nothing. The disciples are going to end up making a huge catch, showing that Christ is still with them after the resurrection. Yes, he is going to ascend to heaven. He's going to ascend to be with the Father. But the reality of life post-resurrection means that Christ 
is still with them. He will be with them even as he returns to the Father. Jesus still speaks. The disciples hear a voice on the shore and they obey it, even though they don't know at that time who it is. They're experienced fishermen. They've been battling it out all night. It's absurd to think that if they just throw the net on the other side of the boat, they'll somehow make a catch when they've been trying to make a catch the whole night. Here they are going to listen to a mysterious stranger. The question has got to be, why on earth would disciples listen to a voice that they do not recognize on the shore and obey it when it's, it's giving a command that seems to be absurd? John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me. What's happening in this passage? They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know. They can't, cannot see that it is him. They hear his voice and they follow in obedience. It doesn't matter how absurd it sounds. And they make a catch. Jesus will continue to speak even though he ascends to the Father. Jesus still provides. All of this takes place on the Sea of Tiberias um, or the Sea of Galilee. The last time we were in Tiberias, uh, the Sea of Tiberias, we're told Jesus feeds 5,000. He gives the 5,000 people fish and bread. There is a massive crowd. They're all going hungry. Jesus turns to Philip and says, where shall we buy bread to feed all these people? Notice it's where shall we buy bread? Philip and the disciples are being included in Jesus' attempt to feed the people. There is no place to buy bread, and Philip responds, even if there was, even if we spent all the money we have, everyone would just get a small little portion. Well, then, out of nowhere, a small boy appears. He has five small bread loaves and two fish. He offers them to the disciples and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus takes that bread and that fish, and he feeds 5,000 people. In John 21... Jesus is going to be the reason that the disciples catch any fish at all. They will go out to fish, but even when they're back on shore, it's Jesus who will feed them. He will have bread and fish prepared for them. Jesus could have just fed them and provided for them with the fish and bread that he had, and yet he calls the disciples to bring some of the fish that they have caught. They're going to contribute towards the breakfast Jesus is putting on. Just like the small boy after the resurrection, the disciples are going to be called to participate in God's mission. They're going to be called to Christ's service. Yes, it will all depend on Christ. Christ's mission, his kingdom will succeed all because of what Christ does. And yet, he still calls us to serve him in his mission. And that mission will be a success. The disciples catch a large amount of fish, 153, we're told. Don't know exactly why we're told 153. A whole lot of people come up with great reasons as to why it's 153 as opposed to 152. I don't know about that. I am, I am convinced it is a large amount of fish and a large amount of large fish. But we're given a second detail there. The nets were not broken. Not a single fish escaped. That little detail circles back to John chapter 10, verse 28. My sheep hear my voice, he says. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. No one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. Here, John chapter 21, an exact amount of fish has been caught. Not one has been lost. What do I think is happening here in John 21? I think Jesus is redirecting his aimless disciples, his aimless and wandering disciples, into his service. And the resurrection is going to be the foundation for understanding the mission that lies ahead. God calls us to a life shaped by the resurrection. What does the resurrection mean? And the mission mean, what does the resurrection mean for the mission? 
What does it mean for the disciples? What does it mean for us? What does it mean for the mission of the church? Jesus is still with us. He still speaks. He provides. Jesus' mission will succeed. All of this, all of it, gives us purpose, gives us reason to serve him. Jesus here is calling us to have our lives shaped by the resurrection. So how does it apply to us? The voice of the resurrected Lord redirects our aimless wandering and gives us purpose. He calls us to his service. The voice of the resurrected Lord redirects our aimless and purposeless wandering. He calls us into his service. As we begin to start reading John chapter 21, I cannot get it out of my head at how disappointed I am in the disciples that they're not all out for Christ, that they're not out on the road sharing the gospel, proclaiming his name, giving evidence for Christ, bringing people to eternal life, pointing the lost, those who are in darkness, to the reality of the resurrection. As I read John chapter 21, I'm expecting them to be purpose-filled. I'm expecting them to have a mission. I'm expecting them to be willing to sacrifice everything to give Christ glory and to welcome everybody else into Christ's kingdom. He is the ruling, reigning Lord. He's defeated death. He's had victory. He's died for sins. He's died that everyone might be forgiven. Everyone who confesses his name and places their trust in him can be forgiven. And yet here we have the disciples almost aimlessly wandering about and yet, as I read this passage, I notice that two of the disciples' names are not mentioned. And I think what's happening here is a literary tool where we are being invited to realize that we're part of the story just as much as the disciples are. We're being invited to, to know that actually, this is our story. We too have purpose. We too have a name. We too know of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know he's been raised from the dead. We all, every one of us here sitting here today, know the resurrection matters. It's life and death. News, this good news, is life and death to those on the streets outside. The question is, and the question that haunts me is, well, what is the purpose then for us? Are we somehow wandering aimlessly in the wrong direction? Have we turned from our mission, even just ever so subtly? You know, the world that we live in is increasingly distracting. We live in a technol technological age where everything grasps for our attention. Attention now, in this present day, is the currency of this world. Everything is fighting for our attention, and we stand, or do we stand, passively and give ourselves over to it. I think what the passage is doing is it's challenging us to consider the lives we have and ask if our lives have been shaped by the reality of the resurrection. What are we giving ourselves over to? It's all well and good to have great hobbies. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing, unless they're illegal. But in this passage, Fishing is not illegal. This is a good thing to do, and I have no doubt that the disciples will fish after this. They've got to feed themselves, right? But the question is, is this the thing they should be doing at this point in time? Here we know that we have the gospel. Are we shaping our lives around the significance of that truth, or are we being distracted away from that? What are you giving yourselves over to? What is the, how are you spending your time? It's good to do good things. It's good to have fun. It's good to have hobbies. The question is, are we giving them the right proportion? 
the Lord Jesus Christ, I think, in this passage is calling us, encouraging us to know that we all have purpose. We all have a mission. We are part of it. We're all an integral part of it. We've all been called. We all know he's been raised from the dead. We have this life-giving message. What are we going to do with it? Will we share it? Will we have the confidence to go out into the world and tell everyone about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done? Tell everyone that they can be drawn out of darkness and into the light. Be encouraged. Christ has been raised from the dead. He is still with us. He still speaks to us. He still provides. And his mission will succeed. Will we trust in him and give our lives over to his service as we ought to? Psalm 90, verse 12, is a wonderful prayer for us to pray. The psalmist writes, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain wisdom, a heart of wisdom. It ends with a prayer. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands, Lord. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Would you pray that prayer with me? Father, teach us to number our days that we might have a heart of wisdom. And Lord, would you establish the work of our hands? Would you have us live lives shaped by the reality of the resurrection? Would you use us? Give us confidence, Lord, to walk out into the world, knowing that your kingdom will come. Pray that you might use us. Amen. Our final song is a a great reminder of how any of us can be involved in Jesus' mission, how we can be included in his plans, counted as one of his in the first place because of his amazing love, his mercy for us all. Shall we stand as we praise him for his love and mercy in including us? Thank you.
Please be seated. Amen indeed. Uh, do stay if you're able to. There's tea and coffee in the hall. And especially if you haven't been around much and you'd like to get to know one or two people, do ask a question about anything in church life. Um, do make yourself known to us. Um, do pick up a, an annual report for last year. Grab one of those. Do pick up the information for this Thursday's Hope Explored and the Vox course. And let's rise up, go forth, and follow the Lord Jesus in his risen power to serve him. Some verses as we close from the end of 1 Corinthians 15. The Lord Jesus is risen, and so thanks be to God, because he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. <laughs>